Hello, this is your host, Todd Lewis of the Praise of Folly podcast. I'm joined again by Terminal Philosophy to continue our discussion of the history of warfare. And now we're beginning the history of Rome, which has probably the most storied military history of any nation. And uh, we'll, we'll be here for quite a while. But uh, Rome, Rome begins from quite inauspicious and humble origins. So if we look at the first stage of, of history, we say this is uh, before Rome, and by that I mean before the independence of the city of Rome. So the Roman people you know, were subject to the Etruscans prior to their uh, independence in the early 6th century BC. And this period begins with what's colloquially called the Villanovian period, which is somewhere between 900 to 700 BC. And if we look at this period of history within Rome's own national uh, consciousness, this would be the period stretching from Aeneas to, to Romulus and up until the um, Etruscan, the, the, the seven Etruscan kings of Rome. So if we look at the sort of literary accounts, so for Romulus we have Plutarch and we have Virgil and, and other supplementary sources for Aeneas. Much of the warfare in the Villanovian period is, is going to be very similar to what we see in the Iliad, in the in the Odyssey, and, and in the Aeneid. So you're going to see, you know, sort of clan leaders coming together for raids, uh, you know, basically a, appealing to kinship ties. So, you know, as like we saw in the Iliad, each tr each king, uh, you know, each sub king who's under the aegis of Agamemnon brings their own household guard. You know, famously, Achilles is the ruler of the Myrmidons. And these these are not just his own private retainers. These are relatives, kinsmen. It's, it's, a, it's a kind of nation in arms, but just a very small nation. And we see that, you know, Aeneas is leading his people to Italy within the Virgil epic. And it's, so it's this, this idea of individual chieftains leading their tribes, taking the essentially the adult male population into battle. Much of the combat is revolving around skirmishing and loose order formations. A lot of it is uh, individual duels between champions. We'll, we'll see that. Uh, in fact, the, the principle of, of, of sort of offering the uh, spoils of war to Mars begins with Romulus, at least according to the Plutarch account. And what's interesting is that at later points, the, the victory procession would be led by chariots. But as of the account of Plutarch on Romulus, there seems to be no evidence that chariots were introduced yet uh, to the region. Now, what, what we know about the broader uh, Villanovian uh, equipment is that, as we see with a lot of these cases, is that the wealthier... Uh, classes had better armor and better equipment, but but even they themselves fought in a more open order formation. So one thing that we find is that swords are are quite prevalent in in this period in the Italian usage, and there generally comes in two varieties: a sort of uh, short, broad sword which is uh, suitable for slashing, uh, and then we have a, a longer bladed, uh, tapered sword that is good for thrusting, but can also slash as well. And they range from the archaeological record from 33 to 56 centimeters. Now, they're also called the antenna swords. And by that, they mean the actual pommel and handle of the sword is essentially intertwining animal horns. And that seems to be an art style that the Villanovians were really interested in. And hence, they, they're often labeled as antenna swords. Uh, daggers are also prevalent, ranging from 16 to 44 centimeters coming in essentially three types, the leaf blade, straight blade, and the stiletto. So the first two types mirror the swords. The stiletto is has a is a, as, a, as a dagger type, has a very narrow, hardened blade edge, presumably for penetrating enemy armor. So this is more like an armor-piercing device. And like we see with Homer and Virgil, the, the prevalence of javelins and spears, they came in, uh, again, there was a broad leaf-shaped blade for the spear and a more a more narrow one. They, they came with, uh, spears came with spear tips and butt spikes, 
And uh, the length of the spear was similar to what you'd find with the Greek hoplites, anywhere from 145 to 1.45 to 1.85 meters in length. They were generally cast of bronze, though there are some iron examples. Uh, when it comes to armor, uh, the bronze armor was often done in a cast, so you'd often find, or a mold. So oftentimes the Villanovian helmets, when they were welded together, have like this leaf-shaped crest in the middle where they come together, which creates this sense of being larger and more intimidating than they otherwise might be. Uh, we also find uh, full-body cuirasses, which again are associated with the wealthiest classes. Uh, 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 what you might find is, uh, for a less wealthy soldier, a small rectangular bronze pectoral plate, which would come in two pieces, one to cover your front, your chest, and one to cover your back, and they would be held together by straps. And then also we find, at, at this early period, both the Argive shield of the ancient Greeks and also the beginning of the scutum, which seems to be, in some sense, a development of the bronze pectoral plate in the sense that, like the pectoral plate, it is a sort of square, rectangular shape, but... Beca but it's attempting to, to cover more of the body in protection in individual combat. So whereas the Argive shield tends to only cover half the body, which is why the Greeks fought in these tight phalanx formations, the scutum attempts to cover more of the body with an individual fighter. And as we'll see in later Roman history, that tends to favor the, the sword rather than the spear because the, the spear takes up more space and it's more difficult to use with this kind of uh, system of, of protection. And uh, javelin warfare and skirmishing, again, does seem to be predominant because much of the warfare at this time is a sort of war of brigands where you might be stealing wives, you know, Romulus is raped by the Sabian women, stealing livestock and cattle, um, and just attempting to meet the limited material needs of the tribe that you're dealing with. But it also needs to be understood that warfare at this time was not just interested in material gain. It, it arguably more importantly of all was to fight for personal honor, right? So these, these, these chieftains are competing with each other in personal combat, which is a part of this broader struggle that they're fighting in order to gain honor and prestige within their own society to demonstrate who is the best. In a lot of ways, it would be helpful to think of early Roman Villanovian warfare as very similar to what we saw with the Germans in the 5th century AD and the Vikings in the 8th. These loose order war bands led by tribal chieftains who are maintain their power and influence by winning successful battles, either by demonstrating individual prowess in combat, saying that I'm the best, or by you know winning booty from sacking other tribes in order to demonstrate to their followers that if you follow me, you'll get some stuff. And, and this really does seem to be the milieu in which Rome is developing. Much of the city-states in the region are independent, not under any sort of aegis. So it's much like ancient Greece, where these fiercely independent city-states are constantly always bumping up against each other. And this is sort of a rough overview of what we would call the, the Villanovian phase of the Roman period. What are some of your insights, Terminal Philosophy? All right. Well, I think that's a great introduction. You know, uh, just to state real quickly, I think the mythological origins of Rome are fairly well known, even for the casual student of history. Uh, the myth of Romulus and Remus are well within public consciousness. Um, however, what is uh, not so well established in the modern analysis of Rome is the Villanovan civilization. And uh, Villanovan culture is certainly the originator to the band or clan warfare that would later come to dominate the Italian boot. And as you said earlier, the the warfare and sort of system and the way that warfare is carried out was very much socially organized in terms of how well certain war warriors were armed. It's very similar to the earlier Greeks where much of the equipment um, that was brought out onto the battlefield was more or less a sign of kind of the warrior's uh, status or their, their family status. Um, you know, the the Villanovan period was interesting because much of the weapons and the pectoral plates and the scopus uh, shields 
um, as well as the swords and copuses that were found archaeologically. Uh, there, there's certainly a mix between bronze and iron. This is certainly like the transitional phase, anywhere from the seventh century, uh, ninth century BC, excuse me, to the seventh century. This was sort of the bronze to Iron Age transitional period for the Villanovans. Um, the iron, I think, was more scarce towards the beginning, but um, the Villanovans were known to have iron even early on, uh, and even just working with iron tools. So they were certainly within the Iron Age, but they, it was more common to see bronze weapons from what I was able to find. But um, as you were getting at earlier, much of the warfare was more uh, clan and sort of band uh, organized. So, and there was an, I think there's an important distinction here to make between, I guess what you could call loosely as a warrior and what you would call as a professional soldier. There was really no um, formal training as like a military unit that you would think of like a boot camp or being sent through some type of formal training week I, or, or through a formal training program, excuse me. Uh, warriors are more honor bound and more um, organized around a tight group of a, like a clan, a family. Uh, the f sort of warfare centered around families is certainly would later become more of an Etruscan and, and Latin uh and uh, italic thing whereas uh the professional soldier would come later on sort of after the seven kings of rome or at least around the the era of the seven kings so i think uh i think that's a good introduction into uh, villanovan culture though yeah so one one thing that we see with early at least earlier roman uh developments is that the the military structure is essentially a reflection of already existing civil structures. And so the, the already existing tribal identities and clan loyalties are, are directly translated into a, a military context. So the tribal chieftain is now the commander, his uh, kinsmen are now his loyal retainers. And, and that's sort of what we see. Now, the, the, big, the big step that comes next is the Etruscan period. And the, the Etruscan period we see two things introduced. One, one is the idea that we have chariots now, and then the other is the, the hoplite formation. Now, whether that's because the Etruscans brought this from contact with the Greeks or because the Etruscans developed it independently on their own is somewhat of a debate. Most people tend to think that the Etruscan uh, phalangite formations were derivative of contact with the Greeks. And uh, the idea of, of chariot warfare is, is likely, if we assume an Eastern providence to the Etruscans and Romans, likely the result of that Eastern origin that they came from Asia Minor, which is preserved in the, the myths and legends of Virgil. Now, if we look at the actual hoplite formations, for example, the, the, the uh, late Peter Connolly seems to think that they were organized much along the classic Greek lines. So they were organized in lochases, which is a 12 by 8 hopolite formation, and then four oragoi. And so they would employ as well different ethnicities. So there's, but they would be a little divided along ethnic lines. So there's the Etruscans, which fight in the hoplite formations, and then the Romans and the Latins, which tend to fight in a more open order style formation. And this is generally still preserving the sort of tribal ethnic identities that we saw with the Villanovian culture, but that the Etruscans are willing to include people outside of their direct kinship group in some sort of allied capacity. The, the next step would be Severus Tullius, who according to legend is the second king of Rome. He decides to create a new social order based on class rather than ethnic kinship ties. And in so doing, he also creates a new military system. Now what he ends up doing is organizing them along six lines based on wealth, from the most wealthy to the least wealthy. The most wealthy or first class are generally are armed in the same fashion as the hoplites. So they were formed into 80 centuries, uh, and a century is roughly 80 to 100 men. And they were armed in a classic hoplite 
style helmet, shield, cuirass, greaves, spear, and sword. So reference back to the earlier episode that Terminal Philosophy and I did on the Hoplite formation, and it's pretty much what the Etruscans had here. The first class also had uh, attached to it uh, two sentries, uh, one of armor bearers and one of engineers. Though it's one wonders what that might have amounted to since Roman siege techniques, Etruscan siege techniques were exceedingly primitive. Uh, again, reference uh, Terminal Philosophy and I's earlier video on siege warfare. It's very similar to what the Greeks were doing before Dionysus of Syracuse invented the catapult. So what I would say is engineers in this context might be uh, logistics, baggage train, ox carts, uh, maybe people to dig trenches. If the Romans were doing that, or if, as we mentioned earlier, maybe they copied, copied it from the uh, Carthaginians. So, but what we see though, is in the first case, the, the shield is still the Argive shield, which is of course sensible for somebody fighting in close order formation. But classes two through five, we see the predominance of the scutum which again is inherited from the Villanovian period and, illust and illustrative of the capacity for a more open order style. Now, of course, the Romans, as we'll get to later, did fight in close order with the scutum, such as the testudo formation, but it does allow for an individual to engage with a, another uh, enemy combatant with much more flexibility. The second unit was formed into 20 centuries, armed in a similar fashion, but without the cuirass. Again, they're poor. They're not going to have this. Uh, they and, and because they didn't have full body protection, they used the scutum. And what we see is that the four-sided oval scutum seems to begin from this period in the archaeological record. The third class was armed in a similar fashion to the second, but without the greaves, still having the scutum. The fourth class was armed, it was in 20 centuries as well. But there's a disagreement between Livy and Dionysus of Halicarnassus, our two classical sources on the period. Uh, Livy seems to argue that in, in this case, they were armed with spear and javelin only, whereas Dionysus of Halicarnassus seems to indicate, in addition to the spear and the javelin, they were armed with a sword. And then the last uh, group that's numbered for battle, the fifth unit, was organized in the 30 centuries and was uh, in, in almost entirely skirmishers. Uh, Livy says they were armed as slingers. Dionysus of Halicarnassus says they were armed as slingers and javelineers. And then the sixth class was too poor to be considered for any military service and was not counted. Uh, they were, I mean, they were counted. They were a placeholder, almost like a zero in the, in the number system, but they didn't, they weren't given any civic responsibilities or tax or anything like that. The, uh, the fifth and last group also had uh, two centuries, one of horned lowers and one of trumpeters. It would seem that if we look at the Tullian reforms, that the fifth class of skirmishers would eventually evolve into the Welites of the Polybian Legion. And the fact that the first class, which is armed in a hopolite fashion, would evolve into the Triarii, and then the uh, second to the fourth classes would evolve into the Hastati and the Principi. So we sort of already see in germinal form all of the key elements that would become the Polybian Legion of, of later eras. And the other thing about all this is uh, the actual unit organization. Again, I'm using Peter Connolly here, would argue that in the first class, they're argued in a two by 40 formation of Lohoi. And then that is subdivided. And, and then the uh, second, third, and fourth classes are, are, are organized in a two by 45 centuries of successively lighter troops. And each phalanx would be composed of four enomatati, and an enomatati is composed of 50 men. So one lohoi, is, which is composed of four, enomatati would be 200 men. And so what we would say is if, if there was a, a battle that was engaged, between two Etruscan slash Roman style armies. And there would be a lot of those infighting because while the Etruscans had a common culture, just like the Greeks did, and they might even have, you know, united against external threats like the Greeks did, they often did a lot of infighting. We would see the fifth class opening in skirmishing, whether it was javelins and slings or just slings. They would sort of, which is probably why they had the, uh, the trumpeter and the and the announcers in them because they were the ones that were 
opening the conflict, opening the, the battle. So horn blowers and trumpeters would start the battle. Then they would start skirmishing and posturing for a position. And then once the actual battle was engaged, the first class troops would be in the center for the push of pike, so to speak. And the second, third, and fourth class troops would be on the wings, which would give them a more flexible ability to move around the enemy and engage them in battle. Now, there's some dispute over Livy, whether Livy's forces uh, organized in an in-depth defense, like the Roman uh, triple checkerboard formation. Some people argue, how could a hoplite argue, organize like that in the first place? It defeats the purpose of a hoplite to do that. So people think that Livy might be reading his own time back into an earlier period. And so the standard scholarship is that they were just the typical deep phalanx formations that they were engaged in. And the last group would be the precursor to the Roman knights or equites, which would be sons of the wealthy who served on cavalry organized in the 18th centuries. And presumably they would fulfill some sort of a scouting role and maybe pursuit in flanking. So that's the sort of overview of the Etruscan influence broadly and the Tullian reforms more narrowly. Right. Well, the chariot and the hoplite formation are certainly the most prominent uh, militaristic developments of the Etruscan period. I tend to agree with the hypothesis that the hoplite formation was an idea that was imported from Greece and that the chariot also came from either further east or from the Celtic tribes in the north. Uh, this is something that the historian uh, Anthony Andrews has helped popularize over the last few decades. Um, the class-based military system of the Etruscans is, again, as you said, a reflection of the further development of their society. With uh, Servius Tullius, uh, just as an example, um, beyond the military reforms, you know, he was an Etruscan who helped enlarge Rome to three other hills. Uh, Rome is more or less organized around its well-known seven hills, and he built temples to Diana and Fortuna. And there's also there there's also a debate as to whether or not he was uh, possibly created Rome's first use of coinage. So that is fairly interesting as well. But uh, what we see in the Etr early Etruscan period is what we've seen also in early uh, Greek city-state culture where there is this class-based, so sort of a very Athenian-esque uh, military system. And um, I think that that, I think that's something that you covered fairly well, but you start to see the more technical development of other formations and very uh, tightly controlled role-based um, roles for certain men and again it's based off of sort of the class and prowess of certain families involved and much of the uh much of the etruscan period is sometimes also characterized by a lot of infighting between prominent families and clans and we're still not quite i, I would argue that we're still not quite yet to the period of professional soldiers but we are seeing a more we're just seeing a societal and military and material development from the Villanovans to the Etruscans. And this is where more iron weaponry is becoming more common. And uh, scutum shields are more common again. Scutum shields were still used by the Villanovans, but they were it was they were generally rarer among the fighting population, whereas they become more common under the Etruscans. Um, yeah, I think that's, uh, I think we're that pretty well, though. The other aspect of the Etruscan warfare, which again, again, this is so far back, it's very sketchy. But to the extent that the Etruscans had any sort of naval uh, capacity, so for example, 474, the Battle of Cume, where the Etruscans unsuccessfully fight the city state of Cume in Syracuse at sea, they're going to be using, again, referring back to the earlier lecture on Greek naval warfare, the Pentacounter as their main ship. And it's quite likely that the ships that whoever these uh, Etruscans or Romans were, whether it is these displaced Trojans as uh, Virgil states, would have been using the Pentacounter as well. And it would seem though that their naval tradition though inspired by the Greeks was not as um, in depth, was not as systematic since they, they did lose the Battle of Cumae. And, and this sort of, 
gets into the question as, you know, who are the Etruscans? Who are the Romans? You know, um, are, are they in fact, you know, from Asia Minor? Are they in fact Phrygians as, you know, Virgil states? I think one of the, the strong indications that, that they might have come from Asia Minor or at least from Eastern territories is that one, they, prior to the appearance of the Etruscans, Villanovian culture does not seem to have the chariot. The chariot is something that originated in Asia and spread outward through Asia. So it, it seems plausible that the introduction of the chariot in, in the Etruscan culture was used as, you know, is, is evidence that they came from this, this period. But I think also what's in, interesting as well is the prevalence of lightly armed formations. So if we look at ancient Greece, we see around the time of the Etruscans in Italy, the rise of the hoplite formations in Greece, you know, tight formations of heavily armored infantry, where while it's true, Sparta often fielded large amounts of skirmishers from subject states like the Helots and Peltasts from the from the Helot class. It seems that the the Greeks in general, up until the Peloponnesian War, really were averse to using skirmishers in any large numbers. Whereas what we see in the Villanovian culture as it evolves into the Etruscan culture and continues throughout Rome's development with fighting for domination of Italy. We see this idea that lightly armed formations were always prevalent. Uh, they were always prevalent within these formations. And the actual novel invention was the hoplite, not adding light troops as we saw with Dionysus and Iphicrates. So it seems that the Italian warfare struggle was predominantly uh, Open order formations. Um, we'll get to this later when we get to the Samanite Wars, but Rome's enemies, like the Samanites and the Volscians, also fought in more open order formation, taking advantage of the uh, terrain of Italy. Italy is bisected by a mountain range, the Apennines, which makes close order formations difficult in that neck area. This is sort of like what we talked about in the history of Old Testament warfare, where with Joshua and the Israelites, they had the advantage of the mountainous terrain where Canaanite chariots and heavier infantry formations of the Philistines were not as useful. So it, it does seem that the geography of Italy did favor a more open order formation, except in the south where, of course, the Greek city-states developed in Magna Graecia. And it's likely that that was uh, and uh, the Etruscans in, in coming into conflict with these peoples in Magna Graecia adopted it. And also the fact that the Etruscans and later the Romans were more than willing to include large amounts of people of varying different races and ethnic groups in their military formations. In a way analogous, not totally dissimilar to the way the Persians would recruit people from Egypt and Phoenicia and Bactria and Phrygia and Babylonia and Assyria that were not themselves ethnic Persians. Now, arguably, they did a much better job organizing these heterogeneous forces into a cohesive fighting unit. But I think, I think in a lot of ways, this does bolster and support the, the Roman conception of themselves as having an Eastern origin in the, uh, in the Aeneid. Yeah, I tend to agree with that as well. And, uh, you know, regardless of, uh, you know, the Hellenized, history of Rome, the sort of mythological origins of Rome, I think what you laid out there is, a, you know, a fairly convincing hypothesis that uh, the uh, the, Mil the Villanovans or um, just basically the early, early Greeks are from somewhere, it could have been from somewhere by Thrace or, you know, the western portion of Asia Minor. Um, you know, as you said, with a comparison to Persia, of course, I think, you know, the main difference between uh, the Persian forces recruiting from everywhere from Egypt to, you know, modern day Central Asia to as compared to the ancient Italians or the ancient Romans is that, um, you know, they they more or less, even though there was a lot of fighting between the Etruscans and the Italics and the Apuli and uh, even, you know, the Greek colonies to the south, there was more or less a, uh, if you can call it, a proto-Greco-Roman religious culture going on that they had to uh, sort of root themselves in sort of a common cultural foundation, whereas 
because of Persia's vast uh, occupations across, you know, much of the known world, you know, again, everywhere from Egypt to modern day uh, Tajikistan and up by the Caspian all throughout Iran, there were, that encompassed so many languages and cultures that no one was really unified under a single culture or language. And so I think that's what added to the poor quality of the Persian regulars, whereas with less territory in mind and you know the worship of the same gods and goddesses and ha sharing very similar languages at least, um, you know, I mean, even the Etruscans and the Ligurians to the north, up by modern day Monaco and southern France, even they had the ability to communicate with the Celts, even though the Celts were considered barbaric by the standards of the Etruscans and the Latins and the Italics. At least there was some sort of common uh, language sort of um, family that they could uh, work within. So. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. And, um, you know, and also I think it's interesting, too, that by this time of uh, Servius Tullius, that there is the use of, you know, again, a more robust tax system. And um, Anthony Andrews talks about the use of coinage, but there's some debate as to whether or not it was first used by the Latins and in the Italics or by the Apuli, which are on the southeastern portion of the boot. Um, so who came up with it first is not some not so important here but as at the its use in general created a more uh dynamic social and economic system to where militaries could form on a larger basis and i think there is good evidence too that the greeks to the south in their colonies were in more of these classical hoplite formations but because there's so many mountains in the etruscan territory and and latium that um, there was more of a loose sort of a loose order and there was a larger use a heavier use of cavalry to the north too from my reading so uh yeah again we're still in the early stages here of early roman history where the terrain really does dictate heavily the doctrine that will be used in land battles. One thing that uh, bears mentioning is that in the, the earlier Villanovian period, uh, according to both Dionysus of Halicarnassus and, and Livy, the sort of organizations inherited from Romulus is that he divided the Roman people into three tribes, the Ramnes, Titines, and Lucres. This has both a civil and, and military function. Uh, but each each uh, tribe was divided into ten curias, and each tribe was presided over by a tribune, and each of the curia was ruled by a curio. And then when it came for the, the levy, each curia was responsible for 100 soldiers, known as a century, and 10 cavalry. So under a theoretical tribe, uh, under the theoretical Romulian model, one tribe would be able to produce 1,000 infantry, and one century of cavalry. So this would lead to a completely mobilized force of 3,000 infantry and 300 cavalry. And the 300 cavalry served as a bodyguard for the king or the salaries, the swift. And we would argue that presumably the, uh, the cavalry would come from the wealthier classes, having better armor, better able to in protect themselves uh, and fund these uh, uh horses and armor. The other thing that Plutarch states with Romulus is that he begins the process of incorporating subject peoples into the Roman state, which again is a thing we don't find with the Greeks. As Machiavelli points out in the Discourses on Livy, the Greeks never incorporated defeated peoples into their society. Now, wh where do the Romans get this from? I mean, it, you could argue it's a genius of the Roman people, which is in some sense sui generis, which it's possible, but I don't think it's very satisfying. I, I think, again, this, this is evidence that the Romans are, are really more interested in, are, are the Romans and Etruscans are descendant from this Phrygian, Lydian culture, which is itself, you know, an embodiment of this oriental aspect of, you know, we're going to have all of these uh, troops in our army. Now, again, this is this is to be understood as a cultural distinction, because if we look at the uh, the peoples of Asia Minor and Iran, they, they're not they're not quote unquote Asiatic in the sense of uh, Chinese or uh, 
Egyptian or Babylonian, they are broadly speaking in the Indo-Aryan grouping. So they would be, the Persians and the Greeks would not be fundamentally different races of people, but fundamentally different cultures. Uh, and not, and you know, t not say like the Spanish contact with the Aztecs, where it's totally different cultures, religions, and races. And so the the Romans seem to have taken that that Eastern cultural mentality further west. And the other thing we see in this early period is the fact that, as I mentioned earlier, with individual uh, duels and combat, but the sort of primacy of the individual chieftain. For example, uh, we see with Camillus, uh, famously, when we'll get to the war with the Celts later on, uh, it's his his sort of unique presence that keeps the Romans uh, and and and, un, and even in uh, other other historic examples of these early commanders that keep the Romans in place. So, for example, after Rome is sacked by Brennus, they're like, "Oh man, what are we gonna do? Should we leave the city?" And you know, uh, Plutarch states that some, and I think Livy as well, some unnamed centurion has just marched his his uh, century to this area and says, you know, paraphrasing it, we will, we will stay here for the night. We will stay here indefinitely. And that was seen as an omen of the gods that they're going to stay. Uh, you know, the the moral character of Camillus. So when he takes the uh, the city of, Fal of the Falarians, that is considered to be the result of his superior moral character that they respected so much. And, and also using things like subterfuge and determination, Camillus tells Brennus, you know, we we don't we don't barter with gold, we barter with iron. And so there's this sort of um, esprit de corps and the sort of gravitas that the individual commander, even if we interpret some of these stories as quasi legendary, from Aeneas to Romulus to Camillus, this sort of like gravitas of the leader is the central factor here, not just in his prowess in defeating individuals in combat, but in inspiring the courage and focus of other troops to fight for him. It's not a system. It's not an organized system of discipline and rigorous training, but a sort of charismatic leader that is able to inspire troops against the odds. Not that that trait ever falls out of favor in ancient warfare. It, it never does. It's just that that seems to be the, the glue that holds the formation together at this point without any sort of uh, attempt at a systemized order imposed on it. Right. I think that's, uh, I think, I think you definitely nailed it with the, uh, the sort of the distinction between, you know, a, a rigorous structured imperium or Republic versus sort of a, um, you know, a well agreed upon clan or, you know, um, sort of a clan warfare between kings, tribes and families. And, you know, the really the best sources that we have on this period are, as you said, uh, Levy and uh, uh, Plutarch. Um, I think one person that's important to mention here that the king that was before Servius Tullius was Lucius um, Tarquinius uh, Priscus from 616 to 579 BC, who is the Etruscan son of Demaratus of Corinth. Um, he conquered a lot of territory in Latinium and fought um, the Sabines and the, as well as uh, this period also had a lot of Etruscan infighting. But um, Servius Tullius was set up in this way, similar to the way that Alexander and his father, the way his father set up this uh, territory for him as well. I think that's a, a fair comparison, even though there was no great conquest by Servius Tullius, at least his father had um, a lot of successful campaigns, both to the north and to the eastern portion of the Italian boot. And even at this time, there's uh, before Servius Tullius was ruling, there was still the use of coinage to some extent. And so there was a lot of uh, what you could call like strategic, strategically planned um, colony set up on the eastern coast of the Italian boot, where there was a lot of trading with Greece and a lot of uh, Phoenician city states. So the Romans, what you had mentioned, whether or not uh, you know, in in the discourses on Livy um, by Machiavelli, whether or not that this was a Roman invention of you know. Um, 
this idea of either like a Republican, uh, uh, a Republic structure um, where they transitioned away from Kings. I tend to agree with what you had mentioned earlier that this is probably sort of a hybrid, uh, hybridization of ideas that came from the East um, rather than a purely Roman invention. But um, you can see that you know, despite Rome's isolation from a lot of the other events of the Mediterranean world, that they are able to, uh, for lack of a better term, catch up with some of these other civilizations uh, on their own, with again their own um, linguist being in their own linguistic category, being sort of proto-Hellenistic in their own sort of way, and with developing their own clan and military structures. Again, with um, you know, in in generally what you were talking about the structure earlier with the clan it was like you know typically one king at the top and then three tribes or the tribus and then that those tribes were con uh they were comprised of families or 30 curie and so what you end up with is something around the order of 3000 infantry and 300 cavalry uh with the cavalry it uh you had mentioned earlier that these were sort of used in scouting purposes and less so in the sort of greek uh tradition where cavalry were used in sort of a as a flanking um you know type of a um type of a unit but they were used as scouting in sort of a reconnaissance role but um yeah i think the romans can at least be accredited for you know getting themselves uh, established in all sorts of ways militarily economically and culturally and again they had the advantage of being part of this their own self-contained linguistic uh, uh, homogeneous uh, culture and environment whereas again what we've talked about in the past a lot is you know the persians and what helps explain sort of the poor quality of their forced conscripts is that there is no underlying culture or no underlying motivation motivating reason to fight harder in battles because many of their uh many of their armies many elements of their armies even had a hard time communicating with each other so yeah that appears to be a a, a consistent uh a consistent theme where you know if, if there are a group of people even on a subcontinent in places of Europe, if they are if they're united by something common, then they tend to last longer in history. Whereas even armies that are in you know number in the hundreds of thousands, they have a really difficult time winning battles and even maintaining their own logistics because again of this lack of an underlying uh, culture or a really a motivating reason to fight. Yeah, I think where uh, we, we sort of ended in the analysis here is that the early Villanovian period, uh, for all intents and purposes, is very similar structurally to the uh, war band systems that we see in the 5th and 9th centuries with the Goths and the Vikings. And while not an exact replica, is a helpful mental note in understanding this very early period of Roman history, where Italia primarily is light skirmishing forces uh, where independent action has always been the core of Roman and pre-Roman fighting techniques that the Romans and Etruscans themselves are, are likely in some sense, either influenced by or represent uh, expatriates from Asia minor. Um, and that to that extent, we see the, the uh, primacy of light troops and uh, mixed ethnic, uh, including of ethnic formations as allies. And their development was uh, in military strategy often came at the hands of the Greeks, uh, confronting the Greeks, so, you know, naval techniques with the pentacounter from the Greeks, uh, the hopolite formation and from the Greeks. The only maybe non-Greek military in, uh, invention would have been the chariot, probably, possibly from the eastern provenance of these peoples. And that in the process of this transfer, we go from ethnic tribal uh, units to a class-based military where you have with, with Atullius, which tries to dissolve these ethnic groups into class groups, which would be an easier way of controlling these polygot forces. And, and the prominence of light warfare, even with the introduction of the phalanx, which would later be abandoned in the Samonite Wars, is, is the mountainous terrain of Italy. 
And, uh, you know, when we read that uh, Vir uh, Virgil puts in the mouth of the Latin pre chief prince Turnus that they are a land uh, of uh, the Latins are men of iron, you know, living on the frontier and shaped by the mountains of Italy, uh, we can definitely see how in these early periods, uh, Italy was the sort of womb that bred men, to quote Alexander of Epirus, and not women. Right, yeah. Well, I think we definitely agree that uh, this early phase of Roman history, again, is just clan and uh, sort of band-based warfare. Um, yeah, and again, this is very similar to the Goths and, and similar just uh, band groups of Europe. I think one thing that's interesting is that the Etruscans were based out of the city of, I'll probably butcher the pronunciation here, but the city of Vai or Ve, where that was the site of several battles between, especially in the Roman and Etruscan wars, um, and also the Battle of Cumae in 474 BC. These were some of the, these were more of the two more prominent battles of the Etruscan period because, um, there was a lot of, of course, you know, there's a lot of conflict between both the Etruscans and different Italic and Roman families from this period. Um, essentially, I think it's important to discuss, too, that there's three different ways in which Rome expanded during this earlier period. And it was either by direct battles or it was by thoughtful um negotiation between different city-states that they may have been fighting in the past or um, slow colonization and sort of an immigration if you want to call it that um, now this was either due to several reasons for either disease or lack of food or um, basically cities would develop to the point of where there couldn't hold the population that was being placed upon it and so many romans uh, early roman families uh, strategically set up um, various colonies on both coasts of the italian uh, peninsula and um, this was actually happening even as early as uh, ancus uh, marcius this was when he ruled between 642 and 617 bc um, he settled the aventine hill he began conquering Latium, and he also found the port of Ostia, which is basically Rome's gateway to the Mediterranean. Rome is about 19 miles away from the Mediterranean coast, so uh, so that was something that had happened early on. But I think it's important to uh, declare that it wasn't just conquest that helped Rome and the Etruscans uh, gain territory. There was, you know, sometimes there was diplomacy, and sometimes there was actual. Uh, you know, sort of a, a migration or basically a strategic construction of various um, coastal settlements. So, yeah, and then I think later on when we get to the Samanite Wars, we'll see a more formalized military uh, uh, come into play. And I think this this uh, this band warfare, clan-based warfare, will be phased out because. Initially, the size of things becomes too great for the clan system to rule effectively. All right. Uh, thanks, uh, Terminal Philosophy. It's always a pleasure. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, this is. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. This is Todd Lewis, the President of Folly Podcast, signing off.